And if this gap doesn't narrow, in other words, if the line of progress in human development doesn't accelerate, these losses may become long-term and even potentially permanent. Welcome to Global Dispatches, a podcast for the foreign policy and global development communities and anyone who wants a deeper understanding of what is driving events in the world today. I'm your host, Mark Leon Goldberg. I am a veteran international affairs journalist and the editor of UN Dispatch. Enjoy the show. The United Nations Development Program produces the Human Development Report. This is a compilation of country-level data around education, health, and economic security. The idea is to give a more holistic understanding of a country's development beyond economic indicators alone. UNDP has been putting this Human Development Report together for decades. And while some countries would sometimes register advances or declines in the so-called Human Development Index, the global trend was always one of unrelenting progress. Until COVID. The COVID years resulted in global declines along the Human Development Indicators for the first time. My guest today, Pedro Conceso, is Director of the Human Development Report Office at the UN Development Program. As Pedro Conceso explains, the most recent report shows that globally, the Human Development Index is beginning to register progress again, but that progress is not as sharp as it was prior to COVID. We discuss this trend, how the report is put together, and what can be done to once again accelerate progress on human development. As always, please subscribe to the newsletter as well at globaldispatches.org. And while you're on that site, you can use the contact button to get in touch with me with your suggestions of people that I should interview or topics I should cover, anything else that is on your mind. I love hearing from you. Thank you. Now, here is my conversation with Pedro Conceso, Director of the Human Development Report Office at the United Nations Development Program. Pedro, thank you so much for joining me. To kick off, I am interested in having you explain to those who are unfamiliar what the Human Development Report is and why it is so important for understanding the world today. The Human Development Report, Mark, is an invitation to take a look in the mirror for all of us individually, for countries, for societies, for the international community to take stock of how well we are doing when it comes to progress and meeting people's aspirations. It provides data, information, and also some analysis to development challenges, international cooperation challenges, from a particular perspective, from the perspective of the human development approach. And this is in contrast to more conventional ways of measuring progress, which is like gross development product, GDP, or GNI, gross national income. Exactly. So that takes us to the human development approach and what it is about and how is it different from other ways of assessing progress and looking at the challenges that we confront. The fundamental idea of human development is actually very simple. It's the idea that people should be able to live lives to their full potential in ways that they are able to fulfill their aspirations. And that takes us beyond just understanding how well the economy is doing which is important, obviously. So metrics such as the gross domestic product or analysis that look at unemployment rates or inflation rates. So all of these things matter, but have to do with the performance of the economy. And the human development approach takes us beyond the economy, again, recognizing that the economy matters a lot for people, into the extent to which people are able to access education opportunities. If they are healthy, if they are able to participate in social and political life. So it's a broader 
concept on how to assess progress and also how to evaluate policies. And along with this broader concept come other metrics, other indicators to give account of the progress that societies are making. So what kind of data feeds into these reports year after year? The indicator that is perhaps most well known is the Human Development Index. The Human Development Index is not the same thing as the Human Development Approach. It's simply one of the metrics that tries to encapsulate or give some idea as to the extent to which human development is expanding and also to compare countries on different levels of human development. And so the Human Development Index has essentially three components. One tries to give a sense of the extent to which people are able to have standards of living. Second component has to do with achievements in health. And the third component that has to do with achievements in education. So the first component on standards of living, we measure with indicators associated with the size of the economy. So we use growth national income per capita, which is a metric that is very similar to growth domestic product. And what about some of the other ones around health and education as well? I think that really does distinguish the Human Development Index from other sorts of ways to measure countries' relative progress. It does, Mark. You're right. So on um, health, we use life expectancy at birth. So the extent to which people are able to live long and healthy lives. And on education, we look at expected years of schooling and mean years of schooling. So actually, we have two sort of sub-indicators in the measure of education. So mean years of schooling give the average achievements in education in a country. And the expected years of schooling is important because it's similar to life expectancy at birth. It gives us a sense of a child entering into school today. How long is this child expected to be in school? Which for countries that are making very rapid improvements in education, mean years of schooling and expected years of schooling can actually be quite different. So these are the indicators that we use for health and education. So you have these essentially social and development and economic indicators that all feed into this human development index, which informs this human development report. How long have this kind of data been collected in this way? And what sort of trends have you been seeing across time? We've started calculating the human development index in 1990. And if you look at the evolution of the Human Development Index on average at the global level since 1990 up to 2019, you have basically a straight line of improvement. So on average, human development globally has been expanding steadily. This line hasn't uh, been present in every country. So in some countries, there are economic recessions, sometimes disasters, conflict, and it varies and it's a bit more volatile from country to country. But overall, until 2019, at least, there was a story of steady progress in the Global Human Development Index and therefore in global human development. So basically, the graph had always been going from 1990 up until 2019, up and to the right, driven broadly by social progress taking place over the last 30 years or so. Social and economic progress. So there's been uh, actually economies in low and middle income countries have been growing more rapidly on average than the economies in high income countries. So it's actually not only a story of steady progress, but a story in which countries with lower levels of income have been getting closer to those at higher levels of income. So it's a story both of steady progress and the story of narrowing gaps between rich and poor countries. And I have to imagine that just in terms of sheer numbers, like a lot of the progress is driven by China and India. Yes, because of the size of their populations. But when we look at the performance of other economies with the smaller levels of population or other countries, you see essentially the same story with some volatility, obviously. As I alluded to earlier, if you have conflict or if you have an economic recession, disasters. So those usually are reflected in shocks in this evolution of the Human Development Index. And so, you know, I noted that you said this ever increasing global progress stopped in 2019. You just mentioned a shock. I have to imagine that the 
halted progress is owing to COVID-19. So in 2020 and 2021, for the first time ever, there was a decline in the Global Human Development Index. Not only that, but we've had declines in the Human Development Index in almost 90% of the world's countries. So this was something that is unprecedented, certainly since we have started computing the Human Development Index. So it's a virtually universal crisis in human development that has taken place over two years because it was COVID-19, but compounded also by other shocks associated also with the response to the COVID-19 pandemic. So it was something that affected the three components of the Human Development Index. It affected the economy, with all the lockdowns and the measures that were put in place to constrain the spread of the virus. It affected life expectancy at birth with declines in life expectancy at birth in most countries in the world. And it affected education also because many schools, as your listeners may remember, were closed for months and in some cases over a year in many parts of the world. So, and it was also something that happened across all countries almost at the same time. So it was really something unprecedented that affected all the dimensions of human development, affected almost all countries in the world, and did so almost instantaneously or almost simultaneously at the same time. So after these COVID era years of decline, does this new report and the data used to feed into it suggest that we as a collective humanity are bouncing back? We are, if we look at the global average, so that's the good news in our latest human development report is that the global average is recovering. So the human development index is is increasing again, but there are two very concerning aspects in this bouncing back in the global human development index. The first is that the line of improvement has shifted downward. In other words, if you were to project forward the line of improvement in the Global Human Development Index from 2019 onwards, the line of actually progress that we are witnessing stays below that projected line. So there is a gap here between what we could potentially have achieved had we not seen the decline in 2020 and 2021 and the path that we are on at the moment. It's as if we're bouncing back slower. It's not so much slower, but it's that there is a gap between what we could be achieving and what we're actually achieving. So there is like a a wedge between the potential and the actual line. So they actually run in parallel, but there is a gap that represents a loss in human opportunity, a loss in human development. And if this gap doesn't narrow, in other words, if the line of progress in human development doesn't accelerate, these losses may become long-term and even potentially permanent. So I think this is very important because sometimes we think that, well, just because we are now bossing back, it's like we are going back to normal. But what the data suggests is that actually we may be confronting potentially permanent losses in human development. So this is sometimes also described as a scarring effect, something that leaves scars. So it's not something that we can really bounce back from fully, unless, again, we are able to revert the line of progress towards something that accelerates much more than has been the trend up to 2019. Why is this scarring effect, as you say, seemingly now like a structural element of our post-COVID era? Why can't we just bounce back to where we were? We might be able to, but then we would have to ask, what do we need to do differently that we haven't been able to do when we look at what happened from 1990 up to 2019. So what would be the things that would enable the trend to sort of shift upwards more rapidly than had been the case before? Well, maybe our economies can grow a little bit more rapidly. Maybe we can accelerate improvements in health and education. So those things are possible and we need to believe that they are possible but they will probably need something quite dramatic. It could be, for instance, something on technology, on the innovation side that really accelerates economic productivity and economic growth, much more than has been the case in the past. It can be a big investment in um, 
accelerating progress on health and education, particularly in the countries that are falling behind. But actually what we're seeing is concerning and suggests that we may actually not be in a position to close those gaps in the short run. And that relates to my second point about the reasons to be concerned with this bouncing back. So the second element of concern has to do with the fact that countries at the lowest level of the Human Development Index are now falling behind countries with the highest levels of the Human Development Index. So you may remember, and your listeners may remember, that I mentioned that this improvement in the Global Human Development Index was something that we saw not only as reflecting an improvement on average in human development, but we also saw a narrowing of the differences between countries at the top and at the bottom. Now, the last four years, from 2020 up to 2023, we see that this narrowing has stopped. And in fact, we are now seeing a widening. In other words, countries with the highest levels of human development index are, are improving much more rapidly than the countries with the lowest levels of the Human Development Index. You would think that that would be the opposite case under normal circumstances, like a country, I don't know, like Norway, which I presume is very high, if not the top of the latest index, doesn't really have much more to improve. Whereas a country like, I don't know, the Central African Republic, which I would imagine is very low on the bottom, you know, it's easier for them to improve considering the low level from which they're starting compared to, say, Norway. So you would think that it would be like easier for a country lower on the index to improve than it would be for a country higher on the index. But apparently that's not the case. Exactly. That's what you would expect. And not only who you would expect, but it's desirable also from a normative perspective. That's what we would want. I mean, that's all, the whole aspiration of development is that we narrow this gap. Certainly for human development, the aspiration is that, again, going back to this idea of people living their lives to their full potential. So the fact that these countries, it's not only that they are not improving their human development index as rapidly as those at the top, their levels were already very low. So there's like a double whammy here of exclusion or these countries being left behind. And obviously this goes against the aspiration of the 2030 Agenda, which contains the pledge to leave no one behind and to reach those furthest behind first. So I think it's very concerning that we are seeing this, we call it a pattern of divergence that breaks with a pattern of convergence that had taken place over the last two decades or so. So that's fascinating. So that really is one of the core impacts of COVID that this report reveals is that whereas the gap was narrowing from, say, 1990 to 2019 between countries highest on the index and those lowest on the index. Now that gap is widening. Are there specific causes you could identify for why that is the case? I mean, thinking on the top of my head, I would imagine that wealthier countries higher on the list, you know, they had all of the stimulus that they would inject into society to help offset the effects of COVID. Turns out that stimulus led to high inflation, which is impacting poorest countries the hardest at this moment, which weren't able to have that kind of stimulus to offset the impact of COVID. Is that about right, like the macroeconomic reason this is happening, or is there something else as well? No, it is absolutely right, Mark. So high income countries had the ability to have very strong fiscal responses. In fact, in the context of the European Union, there was an unprecedented measure in that countries mutualized their debt. And there was a huge stimulus program from the European Commission also to help countries to recover. There was also very, very strong response from the monetary authorities, from central banks. The US Fed, for instance, essentially guaranteed that no viable firm would go bankrupt because they would buy their bonds and guarantee that they would be solvent. So these measures were quite aggressive by some accounts unprecedented. Certainly the mutualization of that in the context of the European Union had never taken place and enabled then this bouncing back much more rapidly of the economies with higher income levels and higher levels of human development index. This was something that countries, the poorest and most vulnerable segments of our international community were not able to deploy They didn't have the the instruments 
to deploy them during the pandemic. And as you said, they are now also having to face the consequences of the responses of central banks in high income countries that are increasing their interest rates that are making the debt service much more expensive. Not only did they not have the ability to respond in the same way, they are now saddled with very high levels of debt that they have to service at a much higher cost. And this then takes us to the analysis of the Human Development Report that we just published, because this is a story that is sort of well known. And the angle that we take here in the latest Human Development Report is by suggesting that actually what happened was the ability of our international community to manage a shock that was shared, to manage our interdependencies, our interlinkages, in a way that ultimately is resulting in these potential permanent losses in human development on the one hand, and secondly, on the fact that we are seeing these gaps widening again between the richest and the poorest countries in the world. And so does the report suggest any concrete measures to ameliorate those two challenges, particularly the widening gap between countries higher on the index and lower on the index? And, you know, is the answer anything beyond simply, you know, more development assistance, more international solidarity? You would think that if it was just a matter of countries having not done something right and needing assistance, that would be the only solution. It's certainly part of the solution. For instance, countries do need debt relief. Low and even some middle-income countries do need debt relief. But the emphasis that we give in the report takes us back to this more systemic approach of the inability of our international community to manage interdependencies. Because it's not one or two countries that did sort of something that put them in this position. This was something that was not in a sense of their own making. It was the inability to manage this interdependence, something at the international level, at the systemic level, that's the real failure here, or the root cause of the failure, we argue in the report. And so the next question is why? Why did this happen? And this takes us then to the central theme of the report, which is this idea of political polarization. In what ways did political polarization contribute to these negative trends? So the political polarization is something where societies or groups within societies become very far apart from each other, defining not only differences in opinions, difference in views, but really going to the identity of people. And when societies become polarized, it becomes much more difficult for societies to come together both domestically but also internationally in addressing these shared challenges. So I think this was something that we saw playing out during the COVID-19 pandemic with very sharp relief. Lastly, looking ahead, where do you expect these trends to end up to continue in you know, next year's reports? Like, How do you see these trends evolving? So I think it depends on the response. It depends on whether we pay attention and have the mechanisms and the actions to manage these interdependencies in a way that mitigates or reverses really this process of divergence. So looking ahead, and the report also presents evidence on this, if you take a challenge like climate change, if we don't manage to aggressively mitigate climate change, what we will see is a further increase in these inequalities not only economic inequalities, but also inequalities in achievement, certainly in health, with an increase in the difference between mortality rates in rich countries and poor countries. So I think that what we went through was a warning that should make us really understand the need to recognize that we live in an interdependent world, in a shared planet. And it doesn't mean that we have to agree on everything. There will be differences between countries, there will be different interests, countries compete with one another, but that is not incompatible with this idea of defining arenas where countries can find common ground and cooperate. Failing to do so can lead us to a repetition of what we saw in 2020 and 2021. So not only declines in the Global Human Development Index, but also 
a continuation of this divergence that we are also seeing unfolding at the moment. Pedro, we'll have to leave it there. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Mark. It was a pleasure. Thanks for listening to Global Dispatches. The show is produced by me, Mark Leon Goldberg. It is edited and mixed by Levi Sharp. If you are listening on Apple Podcasts, make sure to follow the show and enable automatic downloads to get new episodes as soon as they're released. On Spotify, tap the bell icon to get a notification when we publish new episodes. And of course, please visit globaldispatches.org to get on our free mailing list, get in touch with me, and access our full archive. Thank you.